bonus jobs. We have um, clean the gnome fountain. These are all pretty big maps. So we're gonna... Did I not get the... Uh... I, I guess it was an event. I thought it was just free content. This, no, this isn't... What? Hold on. Career bonus jobs. Clean the gnome fountain. Uh, so I'm limited to these things, huh? Not sure I like that. You should let me play with whatever I have. This is, it's not like this is challenge mode either. This is just, it's just like bonus content. Yep, I'm limited to just this. Hmm. Well, at least I have my full array of nozzles. Can I not, uh, unless there's another side to it. Feels so weird to have such a low pressure washer. Uh, right. Gotta remember the controls. Um. Got it. Well, we can enjoy this map. I might I might not talk for a bit, just so I can enjoy it and relax, rest my voice. Now if I if I get on a ranty topic, then you'll know. You'll know my voice won't rest. Finish off this stuff here.
There we go. Hold on.
Ah. Pushing all the wrong buttons. Welcome in, Puzzle. I'm doing okay, just kind of taking this opportunity to relax. Sorry if I'm uh, a little quiet, but I'll definitely talk if, if people are, are talking in chat. During the Skyrim segment, we'll, we'll be, of course, more vocal. But this is just as much relaxation time for me as it is for everyone else. Oh, come on, pick the thing. Oh, I did. I, did, I just... I'm being dumb. So, but please, by all means, chat up. I'll chat with you. Or lurk, if that's what you want. I'm just being quiet because talking is exhausting. <laughs> and I have had times where I will literally say talking is exhausting and then spend the next four hours ranting about some stupid bullshit. <laughs> No worries, I'm, I'm in the waking up segment as well. Got your coffee and I'm happy to come visit. Well, thank you for stopping by. Enjoy your coffee. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be here to chat. I had to be up this morning 
at normal time, couldn't sleep in. However, usually on stream days, I don't like to sleep in anyways. Because then I can get a few things done, and then also have a timely breakfast and all that. But this morning I had to go get my monthly injection. Which is, you know, done and over with, and I, I get it again in a month. Feel the same way with talking exhaustion, plus like you said, the bigger talk points come in Skyrim. Uh, time, so it's nice to relax a bit when you can, of course, yeah. And I have absolutely no problem chatting right now. This just... I'll take the opportunity when I can get it. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's clean enough. I was gonna ask if the injection went well and such. Glad to hear it. Yeah, it no more or less painful than usual. It's only when, like, um... Because the needle is quite large for the type of injection it is. Because it's it's subcutaneous, which means it goes directly into the into fat tissue. So it's quite a large needle, as in like its diameter. Like it's <laughs> you could feed someone with it. But when when what because it's that big, because it has to be. Sometimes the injection site is still, like, open, so some of the medicine leaks out just a little bit. And when it leaks out into the air and onto the regular skin, not just the fat tissue, it tends to sting a little, but it doesn't last long. It just stings for a little bit, they put the band-aid on, I get pretty much by the time I get home it stops hurting. And with the intramuscular one, the one I used to get, the arm, either the arm or the hip where it would go would just hurt until I got home anyway. So it's either a slight amount of stinging or some, like, deeper muscle, muscle pain. Either way, it's fine. Oh, no, they, they do. It's, that's standard procedure. Pretty much as soon as she... Sh a, f a few minutes after the nurse put the Band-Aid on, the, the pain went away. That and, of course, you know... When, whenever they inject something, they use an alcohol pad. So it's kind of hard to tell if, you know, some of the medicine came out or if it or if the alcohol went in. That sort of thing. It's fine. I, I'm, I've been getting stuck for, you know, a few years now. Just this is a different medicine that I got last year. And the nice part is... Medicine is just a little more effective than the last one. The last one was fine, but the new one is like makes me feel over the moon. So it's like I'll I'll deal with it. Oh, that's the wrong thing. And we only have three more jobs to do, uh, including this one. But another update is coming out tomorrow. Tomorrow, I want to say. And that's a, a Final Fantasy VII uh, collab or, or crossover. Which makes sense since Square Enix like owns this game. They didn't make the game, but they I think they became the publisher. Either they were the publisher the whole time or they became the publisher. Or acquired the studio or whatever, I don't know. But Square Enix owns the game, so it only makes sense that they would have a, a Final Fantasy VII crossover where we clean uh, a Midgar level. Looking forward to the new map for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be great. I missed out on the on the Lara Croft event because I thought, oh, it's it'll it'll just be there when I go to play it. Nope, it was gone after the event was over, so I missed out on it. But, that's fine. I suppose if it comes again in the future, I can play it, but otherwise I don't really care. This time thing, had no idea. Yeah. I thought it was gonna just be there. Like, oh, it's releasing at that time. No, it was the event. Oh well, it, the game's cheap. It's really enjoyable, I don't particularly care.
that and I'm used to like Ghost Recon where they have quote unquote events, but you can just play them whenever. This is kind of a large map, so I might only do a little bit, but either way, we'll go up to the two-hour mark and then switch to Skyrim. Now, if this doesn't take us two hours to do, I'll be surprised, but if it doesn't, we should get it finished today, but... <laughs> and it would go by much, much faster if I could use all my available tools but they limit it to whatever the stage says you get for the, for at least this special job because this is this isn't part of career mode this is a special job it's like extra content i guess appreciate the play this when you want mentality it's the one reason i have done expeditions in no man's sky because they often happen when you don't feel like doing them now that i've had the trident i feel spoiled without it yeah I got to use it for, like, one whole stage. Now, I suppose I can finish the career mode maps in free mode, because it still, it still counts it as, like, oh, you did it in free mode, too. Which, there's no reason for me to do it, other than to just say I did it in free mode as well. And... Hi, Remy. Hi, kitty cat. What you doing? Are you a little stinker today? You being a little stinker? Hi, buddy. And the, the only thing is, I might only do free mode on stream if I feel like it. I don't really plan to turn those into YouTube videos. And I think I'm handling the YouTube stuff a little bit better than I used to. Because pretty much these days, I'm just uploading VODs. But because of user feedback, I'm doing a little bit extra. Like, this was my own idea, but... As far as, you know, I didn't get feedback on it, I just figured I would do it anyways. I'm adding special thumbnails to the VOD videos, and, um, because LJ commented that he's happy to get right into the action, because one of the videos just started with, you know, just getting right into it. Um, I decided that I'm going to, like, edit out the, uh, the intros slash breaks so that it's just all action and who knows maybe based on user feedback on small things i could do to improve uh maybe we'll do more in the future so i think i'm handling that fairly well i think it's very funny however that because sometimes i'll play the medieval music and Sometimes it counts as muted audio on Twitch. It's like, oh, whatever. So I looked into it just to make sure I'm not getting in trouble. And it's like, oh. Uh, this... This supposed content ID claim. Which I'm not being DMCA'd. If I was, I would definitely take legal action. Which we'll get to that part. The editing definitely sounds like a great idea. Yeah, I've been using free play for achievements... And to just replay maps I enjoy. Of course, yeah, like, this this game is very fun. I, I don't see a problem with replaying different modes. Or not replaying, but replaying maps in free mode. But no, um... I was like, oh, well, let's just check, you know, what what's causing the muted audio so I can possibly correct it. So, you know, I, if I'm not 
allowed to play that, I can just, you know, remove it from the, the list of musics to be played on stream. Turns out that one of the one of the content ID claims is false. Either the content ID claim claimant, I guess is the term, is illegitimately claiming it, or the system is just automatically claiming it, but the system is incorrect. But basically, one of the po portions of muted audio on my Twitch VODs was being claimed, content ID claimed, not copyright claimed, because that, that would, I would definitely be seeking legal action if that was the case. But I, I like, okay, it's this song this by this artist, let me go look them up. I looked them up on YouTube, their YouTube video of this song, not this song, but the song that was supposedly claimed, had no views. Although I suppose I was the first one, ironically enough. And it was just a very simple, like, hip-hop beat loop. And it's like, huh? So I go into my recording, which isn't muted, so I can actually see, like, are, is this, like, legitimate at all? Nope. They're just laying claim to a piece of audio that does have music playing, but it's not that song. It's nowhere near it. And, uh, so yeah, and I was gonna be like, oh, fuck this guy. I'm gonna appeal the muted audio. And then, of course, because appealing it is just as much as, uh, a very legal as, you know, claiming a DMCA or whatever. Which, they didn't claim DMCA, they just content ID, cla content ID claimed it, which is why it's only muted. But I would have to pretty much legally be obligated to say what I'm saying is the truth and legal and everything. And it's like, uh-huh. Against the, the power that is the music industry, even to an artist who equates to a... a Basically a SoundCloud rapper with no following. I don't trust the legal system enough to, to, to deal with this. And since I'm not being DMCA'd, I'm like, it's not worth it. I'm just gonna let it go. Besides, I have a recording of the thing with no muted audio that's going on YouTube, and the, the VODs will be, you know, gone after, like, 14 days anyway, so it's not that big a deal. Now, had they DMCA'd me, I would be like, uh, no, fuck you. And then I would, f like, be like, that's a false DMCA. Because, get this, filing a false DMCA claim is also illegal. <laughs> get that. Probably not worth the effort. Good in you for keeping the recordings, too. Yeah. That and I can keep it a little bit higher quality for YouTube. Because I'm recording in 1080p at 9,000 bitrate, I'm streaming at 936p at 6,000 bitrate, and when I, when I actually go to edit the videos to, like, you know, edit out the breaks and everything, I can, I can, uh, render it at a pretty high quality. Now, it's not going to increase the quality more than it already has, but at least... It can, it can render out to the highest possible quality that it could get out to. So that's why I record. And one of the other reasons I record is if there's muted audio, I at least don't have a segment that's, you know, randomly muted. And the muted audio is very, very rare. Glad to hear it because that will hopefully keep most folks from making false claims to be assholes. No, people, if people want to make false claims, they, they don't care about the law, clearly. So they'll just make a false claim, and then when I be like, oh, that's a false claim, then they shy away. Then they're like, oh shit, you're right, I don't want to go to, I don't want to be fined. They're not going to jail, but, you know, they, they'll definitely be fined. But yeah, they're, the person was like a relative nobody hip-hop artist. Like, and there's definitely been cases, because I looked this up on Reddit, because I was looking up some things. And there's been cases of people just 
using samples from video game soundtracks to to like put in their SoundCloud like mix album or mixtape or whatever. And then and then they like put it in the content ID system and then like claim just random people's like gameplay videos. It's like uh you don't actually own the copyright to that music. <laughs> so you can't do that. And trust me, sometimes game companies have no problem content IDing content creators for music that belongs in a video game. Because some game companies are uh, behind the times. Because Vinny Vinesauce has been... He wasn't even content ID claimed, because most of the time that's not a problem. You'll just maybe not get the video monetized. But, like, his video for Live Alive, being a, you know, JRPG and all that, that was remastered recently. Uh, his video, of course had some of the music from the game well be because it's, it's you know it's a gameplay video and his video got like blocked in several countries because of square enix seems like it would be a right nightmare if they called on it too since they don't own anything regarding game sounds and such well like i've even like according to kitty derpiest kitty that is in, in the discord um like they've said that some people have had content ID claims on, like, just sounds of wind. It's like, you can't own claim to nature. It's like, it's like that when, when some fuckhead was claiming the copyright sound for crickets. Like, you don't own cricket sounds. That'd be like if someone says, I own wolves. If, if anyone else uses wolves in... In their in their media, that's copyright infringement. It's like no, you can't do that. <laughs> but you know, since the law takes about thirty five years to catch up, um, we haven't seen an, a, a, an addendum to the DMCA Act. You know, DMCA Act is redundant since it stands for Digital Millennium Copyright Act. You know, that, that, that was outdated, like, 15 years ago. So, we get to look to look forward to a, a wonderful hellscape of potential copyright infringement because of, uh, what AI is up to, and all the AI stuff. And, of course, because laws, you know... Our lovely government doesn't update the laws to suit the actual, you know, happenings in the country and times. So we get to look forward to all sorts of legal gray areas when it comes to AI. Boy, I can't wait for the future. Anyways, moving on to the the usual topic of D and D when when we're power washing, um, I'm getting back into converting old adventures to 5e because my players expressed interest in playing some old adventures in 5e. Mostly, it was specifically the world's largest dungeon. Because, like, one of my players was like, I wouldn't mind trying that in 5e. Because generally, my players like, we don't want to do that because it's kind of just a combat slog. Um, and I kind of agree. It's not exactly the most, uh, the most stimulating 
adventure for roleplay. And since it is a gigantic module for that's pretty much just a dungeon crawl, there are some exceptions to it. But mostly it's just a dungeon crawl with combat. But my players are mostly not really into playing the whole thing. And I'm like, yeah, if we do it, we should pretty much just do one section at a time. And then do something else when we finish a section. Um, but one of my players was like, he wouldn't, w spoke up and said he wouldn't mind trying it, quote unquote trying it, in 5e. So I figured, well... I'll get back to that, the, the, the module being the world's largest dungeon. You know, very appropriate. Appropriately named. It's probably the biggest dungeon crawl adventure. Biggest as in, like, actual size of the dungeon. Not most popular. Um, so I'm like, well, what if I continue work on converting this one adventure module, which comes in three parts, each part coming with... 10 other adventures inside and it pretty much is expected that the players will you know level up each during each of the 10 parts in each book where in 3.5 it gets you from level 1 to level 30 or more and since there's never no level 30 in 5e you kind of have to finagle it with epic boons and all that um Like, I'll be like, well, let me finish that, and then I'll see if the players want to play that. Because they did play it in 3.5, but we never finished it. So I wonder if I, like, convert it to 5e and see if they want to play it, see if they want to play it. And also, if I convert it to 5e, then I can always play it with my online crew. You know, being in the Shiny Breed community. Like... Anything I convert for my IRL group can be converted for the online group. You know, as long as the work's done and can be played. Okay, the, the stuff at the top I need to get. There. Then we clean this. Ooh, we are almost all the way around. And, um, kind of looking forward to converting some old adventures. And it's and because I, I just can't get away from it I've been kind of more inspired to work on homebrew again for 5e but I'm not I am in no hurry to get it started it's wild and content I was doing some reading on the blood throne sets for AD&D so it's kind of insane since this is built around level 100 well 18 to 100 characters which boggles the mind yeah like <laughs> Hard to believe it didn't get that high in actual modules. And the world's largest dungeon... It says level 1 to level 20 plus. But it's 16 regions. Um... And... Pretty much each region has its own little sub-story without really being story-oriented. And... And, um... Like... The, each region kind of has its own theme. So, so 
so like w they they have a reason to like diversify what each region has like oh the first region is like goblinoids and orcs but there's also like a were rat dude who's trying to like summon a devil so like you have to like stop them And then, like, the next next region is... I forget. But one of the regions is, like, a locked-up region that you have to actually, like, break into to get through. And... And it's, and it's technically two regions put together, and the region is filled with undead. And, like, they have a special enemy that's just, like, it's a swarm of, like, undead. Where it's not, like, any particular undead, or, or a particularly difficult undead, but it's a swarm of just zombies, skeletons, that sort of thing. And I, thought, I always thought that section was cool. Especially since, like, we kind of, like, skipped ahead and just started up in that uh, that uh, region and it was really interesting because they had stone guardians who you had to defeat in order to enter because they were otherwise keeping the place shut and so one of my players casts uh, shape stone or stone shape or whatever and turn the turned the stone guardian into like a, a harmless object I always thought that was really cool and I, I rewarded my players for being creative. Rewarding them basically by just, you know, the, the stone guardian rolling around as a triangle shape being harmless. And the whole, like, backstory lore of the dungeon is, like... Oh, it's, it's a prison for demons made by angels before man was created. But, but earthquakes and stuff changed the environment in the dungeon. And so now life is teeming. And you also have to, like, beware of different traps or, or you know, like, beware of demons that might have gotten free. I always thought that was really cool. And I always had an idea... To turn the to turn the dungeon crawl into a bit more of a story thing, by like integrating a custom written story into the dungeon crawl, because there is a story, but it's also kind of like you don't really play it for the story. Um, basically, it was going to be that the world's largest dungeon would be like, a, an in-universe, like, attraction as much of the adventure itself is an attraction IRL. So, it's like, oh, well, you, you go to Dungeon Town where they have this huge excavation going and they send adventurers in to, to go a little bit further, but no one ever really gets too deep, and those that do never return. And then, like, there's gonna be a whole advent giant adventuring guild in this tiny little town... And, like, you'd go to the tavern to sign up, and then there would be a rival player party. Not player party, but, like, a rival group of adventurers who you would, you know, gain a rivalry with. And then, oh, no, the, the guardian titan who guards the entrance that, you know, we're friends with, he's dead. How could he have died? And then the, oh, no, the rival group is missing the same night the titan died. So they must have killed the Titan and gone into the dungeon. You're going to have to chase after them, heroes. And, you know, get them to answer for their crime. And then you go th through the whole dungeon being chased by ch chasing after them. And then... Like, story unfolds and plot happens. And then, like... I was gonna do it where, like... When they get to the end of the dungeon and they face the final boss, the, 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 the dude would be like, Give me your power and I will be your servant. And then the final boss just like kills him in one hit or whatever.
Got to drink some water. Because not not to spoil it or anything, but I think the uh, I think the final boss in the world's largest dungeon is like a pretty generic enemy. Like it's uh, not to say it's just a dragon, because an, an ancient dragon can still be really dangerous. But like, yeah, it's it's kind of like it's just a dragon. <laughs> it's like, oh, we went through that entire dungeon filled with diverse enemy types and, and interesting locales and all these different creatures. And the final boss is a dragon. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's called Dungeons and Dragons for a reason, but still, just being a dragon, yeah, I think would be a bit of a letdown. Yeah, and some people are like, they don't really care for dragons anymore, mostly because I think games like Skyrim really kind of did them dirty. Skyrim, of course, being a video game and not a tabletop game playing game. But also, the adventure was like, it was written in for 3.5, potentially for just the core rules. So, I don't really blame them. Like, there's not that many interesting high-level enemies in the regular monster manual. Of course, there's the Tarrasque, but it's also like, the Tarrasque in 3.5 was actually pretty dangerous to fight. And it's almost always the... My players are so strong at, like, level 25, I need to find, give them one more challenge before we finish the campaign. And then you just throw a Tarask at them. Unlike their 5th edition counterpart, the Tarask in 3.5 is actually a challenge. Because I ran a, I ran a group, ran my IRL crew against a Tarask in 5e... There was four of them. Each of them were level 20, because I thought, oh, they're gonna have to be, because the Tarask is the highest challenge rating monster in the in the game, being challenge rating 30. And I'm like, well, they gotta have some magic items, because in the normal campaign, they'd have magic items. And even then, I was like, you get one legendary and a couple other ones, when in a regular campaign, even for 5e, they would be very limited to just, you know, or they would be, you know, they would have many more magic items than just a couple. Even more than one legendary, usually. Can I, can I set it here, please? Can I, can I set it here? Thank you. Jesus. Can I get up here to clean this? Is it one of those things where it's not going to let me on that side, but it's not that dirty? Okay. Come on, spacebar. If I'm clicking you, you should actually function. Nope, I just have to jump up here. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, they, they did the Tarask dirty in 5e. Anyways, I, I was explaining. You know, I was getting my my players to fight a Tarask just for like a one-off. Literally just a one-shot of, here's a Tarask, go fight it. So, they all had their level 20s. They all had, you know, a small amount of magic items. But still, magic items are strong. Even at, even at like rare, they can be pretty strong. But they had a legendary and... A couple other ones each so it's assumed that in a regular campaign they'd all have many more magic items than that but it's like well here's some but I can't really quantify how many you would have so anyways they go to fight it one party member gets swallowed but you know they just they they can they got out a couple times in fact I think they I think when the Spoiler alert, the party won. When the, when the Tarrasque died, they, they got spit out and they were mostly fine. But they were doing quite a bit of damage on the inside because they were on the inside. 
But yeah, the, the Tarask uh, pretty much didn't really do anything to anyone. Because the players just had so much in comparison. And don't get me wrong, a group of level 20s with a few magic items should have a lot of stuff, a lot of power. But it's a Tarask. So, like, and the only uh, the only player who really had an, uh, a, a hard time fighting it was the monk who kept getting swallowed. And even so, like I said, they were still doing damage on the inside and not really suffering any sort of ill effect. They were just getting swallowed so they couldn't just be free. Ugh. I like the autocomplete with this, but sometimes finding the sweet spot to get get it kick in drives you crazy. Yeah, it, it can it can be a little much, which is also why I like bigger objects, because bigger objects have a bigger window for autocomplete. Oh, come here. Can I jump, please? Thank you. Okay. It's not like I want to have like a super hard enemy that will always kill the players in 5e. It's just, it's not just the Tarask either. 90% of the monsters in the monster manual are designed for babies. And then you have like one or two monsters that are just completely unfair to fight against. Like, oh, the players actually are actually having a hard time. Oh, oh, I just killed the whole party. How did that happen? Like, Shambling Mounds is one of them. How do I clean the inside of that jug? There we go. Shambling Mounds are like plant-like creatures that have resistance to certain magical bullshit. And they can also do quite a bit of damage on their own. And they also have special effects that let them kind of wreck players. Especially spellcasters for some reason. Like spellcast spellcasters banes are usually shambling mounds. But it's kinda like, why is that creature hard to fight against? But all the other creatures are not that hard to fight against. And the answer is because in 3.5 they had this figured out. Monsters got more skill bonuses and feats to be alongside players. Where in 5th edition, they... Sure, they sometimes have saving throw bonuses, and sometimes some monsters have skill bonuses. And sometimes they have an interesting special ability they can do. But most of the time, the players just wipe the floor with them, because they have much more, many more options. And spellcasters can just do, like like an ungodly amount of damage or control effect that monsters are not afforded. And I watched uh, a D&D Shorts. D&D Shorts is a YouTuber who usually makes... You, well, true to their name, they usually make shorts centered around D&D stuff. And uh, 
they made a comment mostly as a joke, or, or at least part of a joke that they were making, um, that they make content around a children's role-playing game, and I'm like, hold on, D&D isn't a children's role-playing game, but now that I'm thinking about it, yeah, D&D's, D&D 5e is pretty much a children's role-playing game at this point. And I've certainly heard the term baby's first tabletop to be applied to 5e before. I mean, 5e's good, I like it, but... It's, uh... It, it holds players' hands just a little too much. And, like, sure, some could argue, like, oh, well, they're trying to go into a direction where we get to enjoy stories and not roll up characters every five minutes. And it's like, okay, that's fine. So why don't I apply the logic of the D&D 5e community and go, that's not what D&D is for. Here is... Like, there's literally hundreds of other systems that get what you want, which is, of course, rules, light, narrative focus, which there's nothing wrong with that. But I'll apply the, the D&D 5e community logic to, Here, there's literally hundreds of other games, don't play D&D. And then proceed to not, not list a single one. Like, the, the D&D 5e community is... You know, all about not gatekeeping, and you know we should we should not gatekeep. Sure, let's uh, let's not be assholes and keep people out. We need more people playing. But then they'll also gatekeep the game because people want to try to make it a little more enjoyable slash you know challenging. They want to have interesting mechanics for a D and D campaign to do something that the system doesn't support. Father, you should play a different game. There's literally hundreds. And then they just don't list any. Poor monk, but I suppose they're one of the best to do internal damage, probably. I hate that shit so much. If you're going to say something, I'll at least follow it up with examples. I might catch others' interests. Or we just have a complete, you know, reversal of... Hey guys, I know I talked about D&D 5e like it was the best thing since sliced bread, but I hate it now. We should all go play Pathfinder. D&D 5e was bad all along, wasn't it, guys? Guys? Like, that shit too. And don't get me wrong, I think I want to consider looking at Pathfinder 2e. Because, uh, pretty much, pretty much I've had qualms with 5e for years now. But suddenly we have people like, yeah, D&D 5e is the best. And then now that the OGL thing caused a stir, suddenly they're all like, D&D 5e is the worst. Pathfinder 2e is the best. And it's like, guys, Pathfinder 2e is pretty cool, I guess. But, you know, maybe there's other games besides D&D 5e. Having said that, I'm contradicting myself. By complaining that people are recommending different games. And no, no tabletop RPG system does what I want. And that is a realistic-ish, you know, believable enough medieval combat simulator. You know, no magic, no fantasy, just... Swords and armor and knights and all that stuff. Like, no tabletop RPG does that. I could make my own, but that's easier said than done. And then people go, That's boring! You just like human fighters, and human fighters are boring! I feel like that's the beauty of homebrewing, too. Tweak things to where it scratches that itch you want, but also know it comes with a lot of work and fine-tuning. And that's one of 5e's strengths, is it's easy to make homebrew for it. 
Now it's actually hard to balance the homebrew around the system, so it's nothing is over. Nothing in the homebrew is specifically overpowered. But so like in 3.5, it was hard to design homebrew and kind of also hard to balance it correctly because there was much more to it. Where in 5e, it's hard to balance, but at least easy to, to, to generate. It's, it's easy to make it. You know, depending on what you're doing. Not saying that homebrewers make have an easy time coming up with this stuff. Not saying that at all. But some of the stuff is just like it's it's in, it's you know owed to the system that it's pretty pretty you know pretty easy to to, to design. It's not not hard to just follow the follow. The design language, as I like to say. 3.5 was the last you played, so you really only know what you've read about 4 and 5e. Yeah. I wish I could just go back to 3.5, but I don't want to scare my online crews and be like, we're playing 3.5, and then suddenly they're switching to a system that is far more complex. And my IRL group is pretty much stuck with 5th edition. Granted, we are enjoying our third edition campaign we're doing, 3.5. But my group is pretty much just, they just want to do 5e. So it's like tyranny of majority. Where I want to just do 3.5. But my IRO group just wants to do 5e. And, you know, it's going to be hard to, to run a 3.5 campaign when there are no players. And certainly I don't want to force them to play on a system they don't want to use. It's just also like we're enjoying our current 3.5 campaign. So I don't see why we couldn't just also do 3.5. And I do genu genuinely want to run 5e for them, depending on what it is. Like custom campaign, I'll do that with my online crew, but I don't think I'll do that with my IRL crew. Um modules that I either convert or is already pre-written for 5e. Yeah, I could do that. I just really want to play 3.5 because it has all the content and mechanics I want. And 5th edition, yeah, kind of does, but otherwise fails to hit the mark. Does it feel nice converting modules? It, yes, because I, I am genuine, genuinely interested in running 5e modules that have been converted. But it would be much easier if I could just grind it in 3.5. But, you know, I don't mind working on this stuff. It gives me something to do, especially since I don't have a job. Just kind of touching up here. I also don't mind doing homebrew, but it just feels like I have such a mountain of homebrew to get done based on what I want in 5e, and I don't necessarily want to work on the homebrew and then my players are like, eh, we don't want to use it. It's like, I, I spent countless hours on this stuff. And my online crew is usually not the one I'm worried about. Like, they're usually like, okay, well, we'll try this out. Like, they're, they're usually perfectly accepting of it, but... Just getting the tops of these so I don't have to worry about it when I'm down there. Like, I, I pretty much have to redesign 5e from the ground up. 
because 5e is both amazing and extremely deeply flawed. Like, a lot of the excuses I see of, like, oh, the, they designed it that way because they didn't want to confuse the player and make it simple and easy to track. And I'm like, so you're telling me they just couldn't have these cool and interesting mechanics because they couldn't figure out how to make it simple and easy to understand or track? You're telling me they just couldn't figure it out? Sounds like a failure of the design team. <laughs> and then one could say, Oh, but they were just trying to get 5e done so they could have a system for us all to enjoy. Like, well then... If it's going to be in beta phase, why do the books cost 50 fucking dollars each? Even Spelljammer was $50, and the Spelljammer 5 ebook is notoriously shite. I think you would bug me if it was in beta, yeah. 5e is definitely not in beta, it's just a deeply flawed system. I'll spray it right in its face. And that's not to say all of 5e is bad. It's just a lot of it is not that good compared to older editions. And then some people will also use the excuse of, all oh, these older editions had these problems too. So it's excusable that the, the new edition also has these problems. Okay, that, that, that definitely doesn't add up. I, I actually really enjoy what 5e did for the D&D community. It really got it to be, like, livened up brought new ideas, new new experiences to the hobby. But goddamn, the the D&D 5e culture can just kind of be annoying sometimes. It's a lot to ask financially of players for something that might still need to be cleaned up, and that's something like there's a YouTuber by the name of Indestructiboy. Um and he he it's pretty much looking at all the problems 5e has, and I don't want to put words in their mouth, but I'm pretty sure, like, paraphrasing here, they've said something to the effect of, I'm tired of fixing your fucking game. Because, <laughs> like, he was he was reviewing the Paladin for one d d and was like, oh, I, I get so excited to show content for other systems, and then I get back to 5e and I'm just drained. You know, paraphrasing here, not saying exactly what they said. What am I missing? There we go. Because let me tell you right now, the one D&D &D Paladin slash Druid, it ain't good. Oh, it's just playtest material. I, I I don't I don't I still don't think that that they're gonna change anything to make it better. Is one D and D just gonna be a tweaked version of Five E? I've heard it name dropped a bunch, but I haven't looked into it. One D and D is basically D and D five point five, but otherwise, oh for fuck's sake! It, it would be much easier if they would just let me put stuff up here. Uh, it's D&D &D 5.5, basically, but they're trying to make it so it's the one-stop shop for D&D, &D, and that there will be no more additions, which, you know, that's just marketing. There's definitely going to be more additions, but they're trying to make it a, a universal thing 
so that all things D and D is just one D and D, which you know it's it's touting quote unquote backwards compatibility for 5e. So anything that's used in 5e can be used in one D and D, and anything in one D and D can easily be used in 5e, and that's pretty much mostly true. You know they they've definitely designed that aspect well, so it's you know easily swappable for like 5.5 or 5 fifth edition. Or one D and D, but like it's got problems still. It's definitely not a perfect system, and it's currently in play test, you know, section. So, you know, take everything I say about the play test material with, you know, just know that it's not finalized. I had the same grubbles when I did this map finding, where you can get on top of stuff, and that's kind of what I enjoy about the different player Power Watch Simulator maps. It's like every map has its own little challenge. Like every map has its own little struggle you kind of got to get through in order to complete it. Which I enjoy. It's just it's frustrating because like there's very little room maneuvering room here. And I'm gonna go at this from the other up from like upside down. And I think that's mostly that the once the struggle is done, like you know, you can just get to the easier parts of the map. Come on, let me up here. does working on redoing the skate park while we hang out because it's the map you enjoy might do the playground next if i feel mentally sleepy after skate park is one of my favorites okay it's definitely a good map there we go Getting a little toasty in here. I might have to open a window. Although, who am I kidding? I'm probably going to have to run the air conditioner. What even is the temperature today? Let's, let's check the old phone. It is. It is currently. Let's, because my weather app has to not only show it, but also show the updated temperature. My phone says 31, but my phone is also saying I'm in a different town. So it's like, okay, well, that's not accurate. Uh, yeah, the, it's a fine app. Thank you. Because, like, how would you rate your weather app? Oh, is it updating? Does it need an update? For, for fuck's sake, just let me open the app. It's back to being in the 80s here. As you so crumpy. Oh, for fuck's sake. Get out of the Google Play Store and open the goddamn weather app. Okay, I have to wait for the thing to update. Okay, it's not updating, so... It is currently 41 degrees Fahrenheit. And the heat is on, so that means it's about 80 or so in my apartment. So I'm going to turn the air conditioner on. I'll be right back. Already it starts to feel better in here with the AC on. And I don't want to sit here and talk shit about 5e the whole time. Because I really do enjoy the system. I just have a lot of problems with it. There's a lot of problems with the system. And I just don't have the energy anymore, the, the mental energy to, to make homebrew the whole time. Especially since, well, I'm streaming and I'm, I'm making YouTube videos out of the streams. I'm trying to clean my apartment. You know, I'm trying to get laundry done. Like, I have, I, I have adult responsibilities that, you know, are a bit of a struggle since, you know... Not only do I live by myself, but, you know, I'm, I'm 
I don't want to use the term disabled because that makes it sound like I'm in a wheelchair. But, for all intents and purposes, I am disabled. Like, things are not easy. It's not too much of a struggle either, but, you know. So, like, to have time to sit and write homebrew for hours on end, especially if I'm going to be modding Skyrim, you know, and all that. You know, very intense kind of modding. Not just, you know, adding mods and that's it. Oh, you know, <laughs> I'm doing quite a lot of work on that. You know, to do that and to have time for homebrew and adult responsibilities, it's like, you know, I'd rather just not, not work on the homebrew. But I also don't want to be stuck with 5e, you know, with tyranny of majority. And, you know, be, un be unable to enjoy myself as the DM. Because this is what a lot of people don't really, don't really, you know, understand. Is that the DM is a player too. And they should enjoy themselves too. You know, they, they are also allowed to have fun. Granted, the DM's fun should not come at the expense of the player's. And I would even go so far as to say that the player's fun has more of a priority. But if the DM isn't having fun because they're being forced to use 5e and, you know, maybe they don't enjoy 5e. Then, and the players are like, we're gonna, we want to play 5e or we're not playing anything. Then it's kind of like, what the fuck do I do? You know? Just find new players. They don't sound like your actual friends. It's like, yes, I will find new players. Where? <laughs> Where will I find them? Be like, I agree. DM's fun is still just as important as long as it doesn't come along with being a shithead to the players. Yeah, no, that's like if people are gonna say the DM. Oh, game hitched there. The DM shouldn't try to kill the players. Like, yeah, I don't I don't think I would want to try to kill my players. I want them to have fun. If anything, I'm willing to make decisions to fudge fudge the outcomes so that the players can still enjoy the campaign and have fun and not just die. Uh yeah, that's gotta be turbo washed, I think. Maybe we can hit it with a Nope, we have nothing else other than a fifteen degree. That that would be considered higher pressure. Gonna get this graffiti off. Okay, let's get the rest of the dirt off. Like, I, as a DM who enjoys challenging their players, I don't want to kill my players, and generally, I feel pretty bad when I do. Like, there was only a couple times where I've actually killed the players. And I felt pretty bad. <laughs> Like, I'm not trying to kill the players. I just want the players to not be unstoppable gods. And if they do become unstoppable gods, then I at least want to make sure that they earn it. Because generally, as a DM, as far as custom campaigns go, finding an in-person group I'm comfortable with is one of the reasons I haven't done much tabletop stuff in over a decade. Well, if you're fine with online groups, there's always the Shiny Bree Discord. And, of course, you would still have to... <laughs> we'd still have to try to find a time to fit you in in your schedule, because, you know, we're all, we're all busy adults, and, you know, th things are hard to schedule. But still, you're, I'm, sh I'm sure everyone in our group would be more than welcome to join, have you join at some point. But if you don't want to, you're you're more than welcome to, to, you know, not join. But if you want to, the offer is there. So. Anyways, um, as a DM, especially in custom campaigns, I'm as interested in seeing where the character stories go, you know, where how the characters progress, how they develop as people, as individuals. I'm as invested in that as the DM 
as much as the players are themselves. Like, I want to see the characters succeed. I don't want to see them steamroll every single monster they come across. Because then at that point, it's like, well, why even throw monsters at them? I've pondered it, just know all our schedules are wild. I do enjoy online stuff a bunch too. Aster and I have been playing Arkham Horror a bit, which is really nice since I always wanted to, but never knew people with the sets of the sets with the sets over the years. Got it. Like sets of the of the campaign stuff. Well, we're already having a really busy schedule. Not busy schedule as in like but like everyone in the groups already has a busy schedule. So, having to fit another person's busy schedule into it really wouldn't be that big of a deal. <laughs> like, we have to just throw the schedules together and see if it fits. And if it doesn't, oh well, we'll try, we'll try next month or whatever. But if you, if you don't really want to join yet, you can certainly take your time. We're not trying to force you to play. this up. In fact, if, if you want, and you don't have to join right away, but we have a three-person group for the second online campaign that I'm running with Chico and Bruxis and uh, Wizzle. So if, if a fourth player were to join, it would really kind of even things up as far as as far as the uh, combat because there's even though they're a level higher than what they're supposed to be, because I wanted to make sure they would be, they're still struggling in combat. But again, if you don't want to join, there's no rush give you time to think about it just know that there's a group that would be that would have plenty of room for a couple more players and certainly the the main campaign is it's a little full but I could still since it's a custom campaign I can just design the encounters around you know more people Ran some alternity with the three of them months back. Give you a good way to say, hey guys, I'd like to run more of that too eventually, but your brain was bad for a while there. Well, uh, you know, a need for mental health breaks is something that is important. And GM slash DM burnout, no matter the reason, is a pretty good reason to, you know... Put a, put a campaign on hold. I've certainly been there. And that's pretty much one of my caveats going into every campaign is just know everybody I might not feel it anymore and end up 
quitting on the campaign. Which is why I'm surprised I lasted as long with the shiny free campaign. But I think it's also like... It's really fun. <laughs> it's really fun to run for them. And we don't play often enough that I feel like I'm scrambling to have to get get a, get the campaign ready. So like, even though I'm sure Shiny could use a break from schoolwork to play D and D, um, I'm still like a little bit glad that we're not running as often as we can, because then it gives me time to like. It gives me time to procrastinate. I'm not gonna lie, but it also gives me plenty of time to get the get the adventure ready. I'm a little worried about her with schooling. Just hope every, that everything works out. Yeah, I I just want her to have more opportunities in life. And if that schooling she's doing is going to give her more opportunities to, you know, make a living, then I'm all for it. I just don't want her to be super duper stressed out. But I, I think she's handling it okay, but, you know, I do worry from time to time, but I, th I think she'll be okay. She's a tough cookie. You aren't forced to scramble to make sure everything is in place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's just... I wish the circumstance was different. But... Like I said, she is trying to get... More opportunities... To earn a living, so... I, I am... I am happy that she has taken the initiative to do that. And I hope that she gets more opportunities... In life to... You know, make a living. Because, oh, shit. Because she deserves it. And I know, that ain't me just talking shit, either. It just means that as a result of her doing very busy hard work for school, that we just haven't been able to play as much. And I'm, I'm seeing the silver lining in that for myself, that now I don't have to, like, try to schedule a campaign every week. It's every month. And if we end up playing more than once a month, then cool, but... Because I used to run an online campaign where we would run pretty much every week. Or every two weeks, and it was... It became a bit of a chore. Like, it like it actually felt like a chore as a DM to, to, to write for, for that. And I was like, I if this is starting to feel like a chore, I really don't want to run this anymore. Because it's going to start affecting, like, how much the actual players start to enjoy it. Instead of how much I'm enjoying it. So, like, if it's going to start affecting that, I'm just going to stop the campaign. So, th that was why I stopped that online campaign for in a different community. Because, well, I, I wasn't enjoying it. I wasn't going to let my lack of enjoyment ruin everyone else's enjoyment. So, I just stopped the campaign. Because DM burnout is very real. And that's pretty much what it was. Was I was just really burnt out. Because I was just, I was working on it every week. And the other part of it is, with the Shiny Bree campaign, because I've had so much time to prepare, I have time to not only keep things open-ended, so that, like, I don't account for everything, and then the, even the most unexpected happens that I didn't account for, but I have plenty of playable content that my players will take weeks to get through, and if they... If they decide not to go through that content anymore, then, oh, I have all these planned ideas that I wrote down that, oh, if they, maybe if they do this, I can improv it this way. And specifically words, improv. Like, I, I, I love improv as a DM because it gives me, no pun intended, it gives me experience. I get experience in improv which makes DMing in the future... Uh, just a little bit easier to do. 
So, like, I'm like, okay, well, let's leave this open-ended enough with the idea that I would improv it. And then I get more usable, like, experience to, you know, use in future campaigning. Space bar loves getting stuck. Like, physically stuck. And it also helps that the shiny breed community is, like, we're pretty much all friends. And when you play with friends and not just a few, like, acquaintances or strangers, then it becomes, like, a, just infinitely more enjoyable. I feel like that would. I feel like that would feel exhausting every single week because it'd feel like a job instead of a hobby you all can love. That's also like, I've been told by people that I could become a professional DM, like, you know, where I get paid to DM for people, and I'm like, I do not want that. I do not want to turn being a DM into a job because that's what it's going to start feeling like. Sure, I'll be paid for it, but I'm already doing it for free, like... <laughs> I have no problem doing it for free, <laughs> period. Far more relaxed too, since I feel like friends, with friends there's a lot less pressure, yeah. Or like, if, if there's a problem that comes up, then, you know, we can generally either joke it off or, or just ignore it or, you know, talk it out as amicably as possible. Or sometimes, as a professional DM, sometimes it's like, well, we're paying you, so you better give us a good experience. You do what I, we, you do what we want. That's kind of like, mm, no, that's not how that works. Granted, I've never actually done a paid DMing, but that's just it. I don't want to because of those reasons. Hi, Remy. What are you doing? What are you doing there, kitty cat? Remy. He's standing in front of the monitor. Bubba. What's going on? Are you tired? You want to cuddle? Remy. Hi. Hi, buddy. Let me jump. It's like a Todd ledge where it's too close to the ledge. You can't jump. If you're on the ledge, you can't move. <laughs> Speaking of, it's going to be Skyrim time soon. Just we have a few more minutes to spend on this. Hi, buddy. Hi, are you ever so cute? Yeah. Hi, buddy. Do you want to come here? Here. Watch your tail. Come here. Come here. Come here, little guy. Come here. Come here. No. No, do you not want up here? Do you want over there? Going over there instead. Hey, buddy. Hey.
Thought the tree was some dirt. Ah! A fail. And we just wanted to stop by and say hi. Wait, did I do this now? Drive by pet time. <laughs> yeah. Just halting in front of the monitor just to be like, Hi, I, I see you, human. I'm going to get your attention, and then I'm going to go away. Let me up. Still didn't clean that up, did I? Let's get up here and do that. Drop. Let me jump. Jesus Christ. If I'm up against something, let me jump over it. How hard is that? All right, gotta clean this edge. There we go. Cooperate with me. There we go. Wrong nozzle.
Gotta drink some water soon. All right, that's the two hour mark. We're gonna drink some water. We're gonna clean this up another time. And uh, maybe we'll get this done the next time we stream it, which will of course be tomorrow. So we'll see y'all later.